Welcome, everybody, to a spring scrimmage edition of Post Game Takeaways with Inside ND Sports. I'm Tyler James. He's the one and only Eric Hansen. We cover Notre Dame football recruiting and more for InsideNDSports.com on the Rivals Network. And we watched Notre Dame's closed scrimmage earlier today in Notre Dame Stadium, our last real look at the Irish before next Saturday's Blue Gold game. The defense won the scrimmage 50-32 to in a scoring system that we won't even attempt to explain. But, Eric, what was your biggest takeaway from what we saw on the field today? I don't know how it added up to 82 points. You know, I didn't try to watch everything. I tried to zone in on certain things. So the three things that kind of jumped out at me were, one, the defense was every bit as good as we expected. Um, I would say two, and we can, we'll can go back over these with you. Um, C.J. Carr really impressed me mm-hmm. as the number three quarterback today. And and the role Riley Leonard did in kind of a bystander role was was impressive too. Um, and, and then really, um, you know, there were some individual performances today of some younger players that caught my attention. I asked Marcus Freeman about Micah Gilbert was one of them. Bubakar Traore, who's a sophomore, Kingston Villiamuasa, who got asked about. They were players that we kind of had heard about, had seen little flashes, and then we saw a big sample size today of them, and and they were really impressive. How about you? Yeah, I think the defense is is hard to not be the main takeaway, just how good that unit looks. I, I thought particularly the secondary which is easy to say on a day when they have two pick sixes and another interception, all all from the starters. They, it wasn't like the number two defense was coming through with the interceptions. It was it was the the starting defense. Um, Xavier Watts had a pick six. Jaden Mickey had a pick six. Long and, one. And and Aiden, Aiden Schuler had an interception that ended the scrimmage. And um, all nice by the players and nice catches and um, some real playmaking ability. And like to think how good they looked and they don't even have Benjamin Morrison out there. That's that's kind of scary to think about. And Christian Gray didn't really do a lot in terms of making plays, but I think that's because he was so good in coverage that there wasn't really plays to be made. I don't think they threw his yeah. way very often. Um, so the defense was really impressive. Hard, hard to argue about CJ Carr. I wrote in my practice observations that uh, the coaching staff is going to have some, have some good poker faces to say he's the four string quarterback going into the fall with the way he played. And if, if that's, if that's a reflection of how he, has been playing and continues to play. It, it's going to be hard to keep him that far down the depth chart because he he looked very impressive and was even doing it with, yes, against some of the backups, but he was doing it with the backups. I mean, he's throwing a 19-yard pass to the one-yard line to Jack Polian, and uh, that might be the first time any of you have heard the name Jack Polian before. So uh, there, there's just a lot, a lot to like about what C.J. Carr did um, and the way he sort of uh, carried himself and, and and managed the offense today. Yeah, I'll tell you, he was so accurate. He could have made that pass to Brian Pullian. Uh, <laughs> but he he was impressive. And and when I asked, um, but I asked about him and Pete Sampson asked about CJ as well. Marcus Freeman led us to believe that this wasn't something that was shocking to him, that this has right. been happening really since December when he came in as a ultra early enrollee and participated in some of the bowl practices, but he had mentioned about how much time he spends in Gino Gadulli's office, trying to learn things, playing basketball against Gino Gadulli <laughs> and embodying him up, not being afraid to kind of push around his position coach. It, it just really struck me. And, and that's not to say anything negative about Kenny Minchie and Steve Angeli on most days, those would have been decent performances by Notre Dame quarterbacks, although they did each throw at least one interception. Uh, but yeah, CJ Carr just had that air about him. He mostly was with the threes. He had some reps with the twos, and he he just adjusted and and looked good. And just even in making decisions, even in you know, he had a after the Polian. Uh, pass they were like on the one or two yard line and he gave a great fake up the middle and just kind of jogged in around the end for a touchdown run so yeah it was a really good day for number 12. 
What did you think of Steve Angeli? He had had the most first team reps as expected. What did you think of his day? You know, it's hard because, well, I, you know, he went against the number two defense and they look pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they look like a, a, a decent defense, but I mean, I think anybody would struggle a little bit against the ones uh, just because we saw, you know, we haven't seen a lot of Riley Mills and Howard Cross this spring because they've had classes in a lot of days we've been in. But you put those guys in the middle and you got Jack Kaiser and all those others. Wow, that's really difficult. I thought he played okay. Uh, you know, I, I think he's a guy you don't – it didn't scream number one today, but it didn't scream all this is over. Riley Leonard did a, a good enough job just, uh, <laughs> you know, listening to the plays and standing on the field, and he should be number one. But, um, you know, I thought he was okay. And and Kenny Menchie, there were little bursts in his play where you said, wow, he's really athletic, and I wonder what this is going to turn into. But, again, you don't know how much of – an opportunity is going to get will at some point CJ Carr just kind of overwhelm who's in front of him. I don't think that happens this year, but it could happen in the lead up to 2025. How about how about you? What'd you think about Angeli? Yeah, I thought both Angeli and Minchie, I thought both had up and down days. Like they had moments where it's like, okay, I see it. They're making nice plays, whether it's with their legs or with their arms. And but then there was the downside. They were the ones that threw the interceptions. Angeli had two of them. Uh, Minchie had one. Angeli, I think on his last one, the one to Schuler, I'm just not sure he saw him sort of in the flat and was sort of rolling it to his right and trying to make a quick throw. And Schuler made a really nice play on the ball. Um, so, and the, and the other interception that Angeli threw was sort of to the far side of the field, an outbreaking route by Chris Mitchell and Jaden Mickey just sort of cut in front of it and looked like Angeli didn't necessarily have enough mustard on that one. So um, it, it, the perspective on both Angeli and Minchie, I think there's some parallels there, right? Like Carr is someone that we think will pass Minchie at some point, potentially. I mean, that's not a guarantee, but I think no one would be surprised if that happened. And, and it's the same with, with Angeli and Leonard. Once Leonard Riley Leonard gets back, I think most people expect him to – reclaim the number one quarterback role for this Irish team. So um, what does that mean for both Angeli and Minchie as the the uh, transfer portal awaits? The, the transfer portal will open officially on Tuesday and be open through April 30th. Um, so that, that will be the chance for those guys to decide if they want to stick around for next season or look into some other options. But um, I wanted to circle back to some of the, the young guys that you were talking about, like Micah yeah. Gilbert. Um, Gilbert didn't necessarily do anything like overwhelming today. Um, but he's continued to just be in a position to make plays. Like he's the, he's been the number one boundary receiver for Notre Dame while Jaden Thomas has missed some time with a hamstring issue, um, which is unfortunate because that's something that really, uh, messed up Jaden Thomas's season last year. So hopefully yeah. he can get that right. Um, but Micah Gilbert has shown to be sort of the guy that, um, between he and Cam Williams that is in a better spot to, um, make some impacts as a freshman, but I thought Cam Williams looked really good today. He was yeah. playing against twos and threes, but I thought he looked very explosive and made some nice catches, um, was getting open for his quarterback. So I thought that was good to see because I don't know that we've seen a lot of highlights from Cam Williams to this point in, in mm -hmm. spring. Um, so that was good. Bubakar Traore, like, <laughs> I don't know how they're going to keep him off the field and like obvious pass rush situations this season. I, he, he seems that good. Now maybe, where he just flashes when like the left tackle sleeping or something. I I don't know what he does, but he he consistently seems to win around the edge, and I I think uh, there's got to be a way for Notre Dame to get him involved this season. Even though the one of the players he's behind, Jordan Mattella, I thought had a pretty nice uh, scrimmage yeah. as well. Even Junior Tuhalamaka played well, played the run well. He had, but but Bubakar had a burst so. In general, these guys were the ones were with the ones, the twos were with the twos. Bubakar was with every team on defense. He was with yeah. the threes, twos, and ones. And no matter who he was lining up with, he looked the same. He looked explosive, whether it was going against uh, the one offense or the three offense. Mm -hmm. He was 
a real standout, I thought. And you're right. I, I'm curious. I didn't watch him on running plays as much. Right. Um, and so I'm curious how he'll do with that. But I mean, if he's a guy that they can count on on third down, at the very least, he's a guy right. that can be part of a package. Yeah, if you can find a role for Jalen Seed on third downs, I think you got to be able to find a role for Bubakar Traore, right? Like, I, um, I, I, I just think that he brings too much to the table in those situations, um, based on the rest of the skill sets that Notre Dame has on on the front. Um, the other side of that, Notre Dame's offensive tackles, I still, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm not. I, I'm not sold on these guys are going to have great 2024 seasons yet. Like th- there's just way too much improvement and not enough consistency that I've seen from either Tosh Baker or Ch- Charles Jagusa um, to feel very confident that Notre Dame is going to be fine at the tackle position this fall. Do you share similar pessimism? After watching today, yes. But I also listened to what Marcus Freeman said. And big picture, it sounds like there's just two people in the number twos competing to be starters. One is at one of the tackles, Emil Wagner competing with Tosh Baker at the right tackle. And then the competition that's going to be more to come in fall camp will be Rocco Spindler when he's fully healthy. And he was healthy enough to be playing today, but fully healthy, giving a run at one of the interior positions. He's been lately lining up behind Pat Coogan at left guard. Right. I think he'd have a hard time overtaking Billy Shrouth. I'm not sure if Marcus was implying that center is in play, that you know they could m- maybe move somebody else to center. Ashton Craig seemed to be doing a pretty good job there. Mm-hmm. But I, I did ask Marcus about you know big picture what he thought about it. And he gave a decent answer, a little bit of a – a coach speak answer, but I mean, he is trying to balance their progress as a whole versus staging those two competitions. And uh, so I watch them a lot and, you know, I didn't expect to see them win a lot given who's in the front seven for Notre Dame's one, right. One defense when it's one, but I mean, they even had some issues against the twos. I guess I'm going by more what Mike Denbrock's optimism that this is going to work itself out and that in August they're going to get better. Uh, but it was kind of about what I expected, a work in progress today. It wasn't like, oh, my gosh, this is a disaster. But, mm. um, you know, clearly they missed you all. <laughs> sure. Yeah, and some of the – some of the mistakes weren't all just like ability. Like I think it was communication and sometimes there was some guys being left unblocked. And obviously that's, you're not going to say, well, the left tackle is no, no good. He didn't even block that guy because he must've thought he wasn't supposed to, for whatever reason, now, whether or not he made the right decision, we don't necessarily have the answer to that. But um, so, yeah, I just think that there's a lot of work to do there. I thought the run game was okay. That like, it wasn't like a big part of today's scrimmage seemingly, Jeremiah Love probably had the most impressive run when he sort of ran over Adon Schuler and then yeah. sort of jumped over him afterward uh, to keep going. So that that was the most impressive run. Um, the the offensive passing game wasn't necessarily explosive, which isn't necessarily surprising given the the moving pieces and what Notre Dame's defense is. Um, right. But the the promises and hope that Mike Dembrock's scheme produces more explosive plays for Notre Dame's offense wasn't necessarily on display, but I sort of like what you're talking about with the offensive tackles. I don't know that I expected it to, to be that way today in a scrimmage either. Right. The, the one thing that is a positive for the offense is they're not going to see many better defenses than what they see from Notre Dame's number ones. Right. And they're seeing a variety of looks from them. They're seeing blitzes. I mean, Al Golden isn't holding back at Marcus Freeman's request, and Mike Denbrock wants that too. They want them to get used to those kind of looks. So, you know, there were times Notre Dame's defense couldn't produce those looks, and then mm-hmm. they get in games and the game would speed up. And and so they are at least having to deal with that in practice. So I thought that's a, a positive. 
we didn't see a lot of special teams. They did some special teams work before the right scrimmage started. Do you want to? You were charting some of that stuff. Yeah, Mitch Jeter in the early portion, I think, made five of six field goals. He missed one uh, on a 36-yard. He, he pushed it to the right, and then he had a 30-yard attempt, which was his lone attempt uh, during the scrimmage, um, and that hit the left upright and didn't go in. So um, not the best of days for, for Mitch Jeter. I guess the first time we've seen him kicking in Notre Dame Stadium, um, but hopefully for him he gets that sorted out. You, and – I thought it was also we didn't see a lot of very long kicks. Now I guess it was kind of windy today. I don't know if the wind was blowing against them. I wasn't paying attention to the wind situation. But usually we see at least some forty yard attempts and getting back to the fifty. But they, I think they were maybe just uh, easing him in, easing him into the Notre Dame Stadium uh, setting and and going through that. And they worked on some punt coverage. Nothing really notable there. Um, but yeah, spe- special teams we've talked about. We. We think that's an area where Notre Dame has a chance to to really improve this season, even if it wasn't the best of days for Mitch Jeter. And and I'll say this: there's been quite a few times where in the spring the kicker hasn't looked really on top of things. With them being inside so much, right? They don't they don't get a real good rhythm. I, I think you'll see during the summer and so forth, and when we come back into fall camp. We'll probably have better reports on how the kickers and the punters are doing. And we'll see some kickoff returns. We've seen a lot, you know, five different guys kind of rotating in at the punt return spot. And that doesn't include Jordan Faison, who probably is still the odds on favorite to win that job. Right. So, but he's got lacrosse duty this weekend. All right. I think that'll do it for post game takeaways, unless you have some long snapping analysis you want to get in here. <laughs> <laughs> all i know is reno monteforte is a hoot <laughs> all right well that's all we have from our post scrimmage takeaways uh make sure you check out the rest of our scrimmage coverage over on inside if you're not a subscriber to the site you can use the promo code ndyt for a free 30-day trial and we also will have another sc- subscription promo coming up this week uh, so keep uh, your eyes out for that and then we will be back here on youtube Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern for Football Never Sleeps. We hope you have a great weekend.